So uh, what we're going to do today is, first of all, establish that the rate of technological, technological advance in the world economy is extraordinarily low in all societies up until 1800. Uh, we'll also see that there are actually societies that get frozen in terms of their technology for hundreds of years, and some societies that lose technological proficiency <coughs> over time. And then we're going to come to the, uh, the, the great question of history, which is, why is it so difficult before 1800 to have what we have every year in the modern society, which is technological progress? Okay? And just to remind everyone, we have the special way of thinking about technological progress in economics. We can illustrate it with this diagram here for the pre-industrial world. So every society is going to have a certain endowment of land per person. And they'll have a certain level of real output. Then there'll be a curve that relates these two. Initially, as you add more land per person, output will go up very quickly. As you add more and more land, output will always rise, but at a slower rate. What technological advance consists of and in principle, what we're trying to do here is measure the rate at which this curve is moving upwards. Okay? Because what's going to happen over time as you get more productive techniques in these societies is that with a given endowment of land, you can produce more and more output per person, given a certain land endowment per person. And we, what we're trying to measure is how quickly is that process occurring in the pre-industrial world. Now, we have very little information about this world, but again, this is just a very nice feature of the Malthusian economy, right? I mean, and, and as I say, you know, I don't believe there's a God, but the Malthusian economy is some kind of evidence that maybe there is, because we make three very simple assumptions, almost self-evident assumptions, and then you get these very powerful predictions about the pre-industrial world, and, and most of them we can verify, and it turns out another kind of outcome of that is that we also end up with a very simple way of measuring technological advance when we have very, very little information about this world. And the reason for that is because of the Malthusian mechanism, all technological advance ultimately will result just in population growth in this pre-industrial world. And so what will happen is that while there initially will be this upward movement here where people have higher incomes, eventually population will increase, so n will go up, land per person will decline, and we'll move to this point here. And so all we need to have is some kind of way of measuring the connection between this shift and this shift, and then we have this nice long-term way of actually measuring technological advance in the world before 1800. And what Doug is going to show you in section, starting next week, is that it turns out there's an incredibly simple relationship between these two numbers. It's linear, and basically, the growth of population will be the growth of efficiency, but multiplied by this number C, which is the share of the income of any society that goes to the owners of land. Right? Now, in many societies, the people occupying the land are the people who also own the land, and so you won't see any explicit rental payment. But we can still calculate that there's an implicit amount that people are getting from owning land. Similarly, in our society, many people live in houses that they own, but we can still calculate the implicit value, the rental value of the stock of housing, and the share of national output that's actually going to the owners of housing. And so in these pre-industrial societies, there's always going to be an implicit share of income that but is going to the people who actually own the land in these societies. And we can measure that number for pre-industrial England back to about 1,200, and the answer is it, it's pretty constant over time, up until 1,800, and it's about a fifth. Okay? We can also get rough indications of what it is in pre-industrial China, in some other uh, situations. One of the ways we can get that is that some early societies had sharecropping arrangements, whereby if I own the land, I lease it out to someone, and they give me a share of their output as that payment. And so that's just directly measuring what this number C is. What share do the owners get right, 
And of course, that's not the only activity in the society, but we can make a rough calculation from that. How big is that uh, number uh, C? Okay, and, and what the labor share is in the society and what the capital share is as well. And so we get this very nice relationship. And what this is telling us, C is actually measuring here, is the curvature of this relationship. Okay? If um, the relationship has very little curvature, then C would be small. And what it would actually say is that modest changes in efficiency would produce big changes in population. If C is very large, it's saying that that curve is actually very steep, you know, very sharply curved, and that consequently, modest changes in A will produce very small changes in C, in, in population. Okay? And so, so there's actually a lot of information embodied in this simple relationship, right? Because it's really it's describing what this, this relationship looks like in society. Okay? And so that's all we need to do then. And so the next thing we're going to do then is just to start thinking about, well, what numbers do we have at the world level for population in the pre-industrial era? And what does that imply about the rates of technological advance? And so it turns out that the first estimate we get for world population is for 130,000 BC. <laughs> uh, and that is an estimate that world population then is about and the population we're going to measure in millions is about 100,000. Uh, how do we get that number? <laughs> so it's saying that world population is about one and a half times the size of Davis. Okay? Uh, so if you think Davis is dull, think about the whole world at that stage. Um, there's not a lot of night costs. Um, the way we get that estimate is we can estimate how much land it takes to support the average hunter-gatherer, given the kind of technology they had. And then you just say, well, how much land is in the world? And consequently, um, what is uh, world population going to be? Okay. And so that's why we get this number, as I say, of uh, 0.1. Um, now, the next rough estimate we have here for world population is about 10,000 BC. And this is on the eve of the Neolithic Revolution. And then the estimate comes in at about 7 million. So what it's saying is, well, there's really been this impressive population growth even before we had the arrival of settled agriculture. And that's based on the idea that hunter-gatherers became much more effective over time in terms of what other species they could prey on, what resources they could capture in this early world. And so that's why you're getting this much greater density of population of hunter-gatherers. What does that imply about the growth rate of population? And we're going to measure this in percent per year. It turns out that that growth rate of population will be 0.004% per year. <laughs> right? That's a number that's very close to zero. Right? And one of the things that shows up here is the incredible power of exponentials. <laughs> so that you've got what looks like an impressive population growth here, but this is over an extremely long period of time. And so what it really implies is that these populations are very close to absolute st uh, stability, to no growth at all, <laughs> right? And what this is saying in, in percentage terms, it's saying Every 100 years, they added uh, 0.4 of a person for every, no, that's too much. I'm, I'm going to lose myself in numbers here. Every 100 years, they added 0.004 of a person per person living in this world. <laughs> right? So no one would ever even see population growth in their own lifetimes in this world. This is a world of extremely slow change in terms of population. And that's, what the, and that's one of the things is also, these population estimates are really bad, right? They could be, in some cases, five times as high or five times as low. But in this world of very long time intervals, it really doesn't matter that much. It'll actually have quite small effects on these numbers here in terms of you know, the, the, the impact of those numbers. They're all going to turn out to be very low. And so when we do that, what does that imply about the growth rate of efficiency 
in this hunter-gatherer world, well, to get the growth rate of efficiency, we have to multiply that population growth rate by something like a fifth if we assume that there's the same kind of share importance of land. And it would say that the growth rate of efficiency would be 0.001%, right? And so what that is saying is that uh, in 100 years, you'd get an increase of efficiency of 0.001 per unit of efficiency in the society, right? Or I think... A, a, that you get a 1% gain in efficiency every thousand years <laughs> in this world, <laughs> right? And so it, it really is a, an incredibly slow rate of uh, advance. So I have to, I mean, I get lost once you get to these, these numbers that are this small. I'm much happier with numbers like one or two, right? Uh, but the important thing is incredibly slow rates of advance. It really is a world of incredible stasis, okay? Now, now we're getting to the point where we have settled agriculture. And so the next benchmark we have is 1 AD. And uh, world population then has roughly been estimated at 300 million. Now, as I say, this estimate is of extremely low value. <laughs> In Italy at that time, there's a debate about what the level of population is where the numbers have ranged from one to three. And that's one of the places we know best, you know, in, in terms of range. And that's one of the places we know best what levels of population are likely to be. The problem in Italy is that there's a temple to Augustus which actually has chiseled on the wall. We did a census, and here's the number of Roman citizens. And I think it's something like 35 AD, something like that, right? And the problem is, though, they don't know, did that count women and children or just men, <laughs> right? And so that's why there's this dispute where the range is about three to one, right, in terms of what the population is. And this is just one of these amazing facts is we, we actually have it down to the last person, but we don't know what did they mean by a person in this world. We know it didn't count slaves, right? And so you have to throw in an addition for them as well. So that's one of the better measured parts of the world. In places like India, which are a big population center in the pre-industrial world, as far as I can tell, there's almost no information in this period, right? And so, as I say, all of these numbers you have to treat very, very skeptically, going back much more before 1800. What does that imply, though, in terms of the rate of growth of population? So, say, it's now up to 0.038% per year, right? And so that means that for every 100 people, every year there's 0.038 more, and so if we took 100 people and 100 years, we'd have added four people to the stock population, okay? Uh, and so, it, but, the, but the other thing, interesting thing we're going to find here is even though these rates are very slow, what you'll see is there's a tendency for them to get faster as we move towards the modern world. So there is some sense of some dynamic in this pre-industrial world where we start off incredibly slowly. We speed up a bit and a bit and a bit but the problem is, in terms of explanations, is then we have an explosion at the time of the Industrial Revolution, right? And, and what's going to be one of the, the kind of the incredible problems in terms of this history, how do you build an account of this history which will have this world of incredible stasis, but then kind of getting a little bit faster, but then this dramatic break around about 1800? How is it possible to build an account that will actually incorporate both this fact that somehow we seem to be getting a bit better but then there's this, this quantum leap at the time of the Industrial Revolution. So this is the rate of population growth. Again, we just multiply that by a fifth, and then we get um, roughly uh, uh, 0.009, I think is the, uh, is the number. Uh, and again, what this is saying is it's per 100 years, the economy is getting something like uh, I, yeah, 100 years is something like 0.9% more efficient, right? But I think I'm, I'm worried that I'm actually doing the mental arithmetic incorrectly in my head here, maybe vastly overstating the rate of progress in this world, okay? Um, then we get to next benchmark, about 1,000 AD. These numbers are slightly better, 
And for world population, the, the quotes that we give suggest that there's almost no gain between 1 AD and 1,000 AD. Uh, that implies that we're back down to the hunter-gatherer rate of population growth, and consequently that we're at these incredibly low rates of efficiency advance. And then the other dates that I'll give you are 1250, 1500, and 1750, right on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. And here we begin to see this acceleration in world population growth. We go, after having got 10 million more people in 1,000 years, <laughs> in the next 250, the allegation is we added 90 million people to the world. In the next 250, another 90 million people. And the interesting thing is, on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, we get the fastest rates of population growth all across the world that were observed in the pre-industrial era, right? Where you've actually got this, this acceleration as we approach the Industrial Revolution in terms of the numbers of people in the world economy. And here we get then the Here we get then race population advance that are considerably faster than in the earlier part of history. Okay? And you're getting this acceleration. Uh, and then the implied rates of efficiency advance uh, are 0 0.020, 0 0.045. Okay? And now I can, we're into the range of numbers where I actually can be confident in interpreting them. <laughs> So what this is saying is, in the 250 years leading up to the Industrial Revolution, the efficiency of the world economy seems to have expanded at a rate of about 4.5% every 100 years, right? And so that every 100 years, we expand the efficiency of the world economy by about 4.5%. In contrast, since the Industrial Revolution, every year, we expand the efficiency of the economy between one and one and a half percent. So we do in three years what in this earlier world it took a hundred years to do. Okay? And so that's the incredible difference in the world economy, and that's what's dramatically changed the possibilities for the world. Okay? But as you see, there is this tendency for these rates of efficiency advance to actually creep upwards as we approach the Industrial Revolution, but they're still incredibly slow. Okay? And the population estimates for here are beginning to get better, right? And so they're more realistic, what these population estimates are, okay? And then one thing we have to worry is that living standards can move up and down in this pre-industrial world. And so what's actually happening is that, that some of these numbers can be misleading because if it's a time of high living standards, then it's not accurately going to measure, you know? It's, it's assuming that living standards are the same all the way through the pre-industrial period. But as I say, so this one picture actually kind of surveys the crucial problem of the history of the world before 1800, which is it seems that all societies have these incredibly low rates of technological advance. Before we go on and, and talk about that, as I say, the other thing to emphasize is that it's not a linear kind of upwards movement. There are periods of absolute stagnation that we can observe. One of them shows up in the English data, where the measured efficiency of the English economy between 1200 and 1600 seems to be about the same. And so that's 400 years where quite a lot of other stuff is happening, but yet there's no sign of any serious advance in terms of the efficiency of the economy. Right? Uh, and part of that reason that that can happen is that some efficiency, some technological advances can simply have no measurable impact on the society. So for example, the introduction of gunpowder and of weapons using gunpowder was very significant in pre-industrial Europe and eventually in the conquest of much of the rest of the world by Europeans. But it won't show up as any gain in incomes within Europe because these guns are normally used against other Europeans. <laughs> and up until 1800, the Europeans actually derive very small amounts of income from exploiting the rest of the world. 
And so in that sense, uh, most of this time, you can have quite significant technological advances, but it, it's not going to show up as any particular gain to people. Okay? Uh, similarly, things like uh, printing are quite dramatic, and for a small share of the population, they have quite profound impacts. But most of the measures we have of economic output don't even measure any written material <laughs> in this period. And so consequently, we wouldn't you know, count that even as an efficiency advance within this world. Okay? And so the important thing is that this is measuring the, the really basic technologies of the society in many ways in this early period. It's food production, clothing production, bricks, houses. How well are these societies doing? at producing those basic goods. And so it will, when we come back to this, we'll see that one kind of possibility is that there's really a lot more technological advance than we think in this world, but for some reason, it's not advanced in the kinds of things that make people better off in the ways that we can measure, right? That something happened to kind of channel technological advance later into the basics of technology, whereas these societies are actually changing quite dramatically but changing in terms of their intellectual technology, uh, changing in terms of the decorative arts, right? I mean, painting is very different here than it is here, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and other things are changing quite dramatically. And so there is this interesting possibility that they're much more dynamic than we think, these early societies. It just doesn't get translated into basic production processes. So that's the first thing. Uh, as I say, another thing to emphasize is we do have a whole group of societies where regression is actually observable. One of these groups is Australian Aboriginals. Uh, they're believed to have arrived in Australia between 40,000 and 60,000 years ago by crossing water to get to Australia. And so that's when the, you know, the archaeological record starts of the Australian Aboriginals. Uh, when the British came to Australia in 1788, uh, Aboriginals had actually lost the ability to travel at sea. And in one dramatic case in Tasmania, Tasmania is a large island uh, just to the south of the Australian mainland. It's about half the size of England. Uh, the Tasmanians had actually experienced an even more dramatic regression in terms of their technology. So we know again that they crossed the sea to get to Tasmania. Uh, by the time the British arrived, their culture was at the level of the early Stone Age. And there's clear archaeological evidence in Tasmania that they had lost a variety of cultural abilities. And so, for example, uh, they had no clothing by 1788 except animal skins. Uh, they had no bone tools, even. Uh, they had no ability, even though Tasmania is surrounded by fish, they had no ability to fish. Uh, but there's evidence in the archaeological record that they had all of these things earlier and that the, the 5,000 Tasmanians had somehow actually started to go backwards uh, over the, uh, the years that they're there in uh, Tasmania. And actually, one argument for why that, that would happen is that one big advantage you're going to get as world population grows and as people are in communication with each other is that knowledge has this interesting property that if I produce an, a new idea, it's essentially costless to transfer it to everyone else in the world. Okay? Uh, and suppose that everyone had an equal probability of being the kind of bright, imaginative person who could produce new ideas. What's the huge advantage of the world economy here as opposed to here? Here, there's only 100,000 people. right? And uh, also, those 100,000 people are mostly not in contact with each other. That would mean that these are small hunter-gatherer groups that in any group, the chances of making any progress are very small because, you know, think about you and 10 of your friends. <laughs> you know, what are your abilities in, in our terms of fundamental technological advance? But also, within any group, you could have a generation where no one can even remember the previous technology. And so the idea is that would be that it's in these small, isolated communities, you would actually tend to get technological regression because you need a certain minimum population size in order even to sustain technology. 
and that the advantage of Asia and Europe and India is that they were on this land mass where there was actually constant contact between them. And they were engaged in production techniques which were somewhat similar across these different societies so that they could benefit from this huge pool of knowledge. Whereas somewhere like Australia, it's not only smaller and more isolated than the uh, Eurasian continent, but also the geography of Australia was such that the aboriginals were spread all around the edge of Australia. And there were many small groups of aboriginals living at very low densities and with many different climate zones so that you know, along the coast, one group could have a technology that was completely useless 200 miles north. And that consequently, uh, there, there's a reason why Asia and Europe dominate in world history as the centers of population and technological advance. That geography is actually destiny. <laughs> Island people <laughs> suffer from this disadvantage of a lack of communication. And that's typically why it's the people from the continents go to the islands and discover much earlier societies and, and not the other way around. Okay? Uh, it's similarly being argued that um, the, why is it that the Europeans, when they arrived in America, found a society technologically several thousand years behind? Why wasn't it that Americans sailed to Europe <laughs> and conquered Europe? Again, the argument has been made, well, it's the shape of the American continent. Uh, Eurasia is, is organized kind of horizontally. Wheat is produced in England, Iran, India, and China, right? There are these contiguous zones of similar types of cultivation, similar types of production. In the American continent, it's organized more in a north-to-south axis. The climate of the northern plains uh, would lead to a technology which was of no use in Mexico <laughs> or no use in central Panama. <laughs> and so you get much more isolated bands of people within the North America and South American continent than you do in Eurasia. And that that actually would lead to a bias in terms of the possibilities of technological advance in this early world. Okay? And so the, the thing we see then is, as I say, that we find lots of societies where there's the re regression. Now, the, the, the trouble with that argument actually is, well, how did we ever get started then in that case? <laughs> right? If size really is a crucial help in terms of the rate of technological advance, and if the reason that this rate of technological advance is in fact accelerating over time is just that there are just many, many more people in the world. There are many more people capable of producing ideas and we can all benefit, right? In someone like China, you know, when you have 200, 300 million people, uh, then you've got this enormous mass of people who can, you can benefit from their ideas. Whereas in this hunter-gatherer world, the number of people whose ideas you can benefit from is, is very, very small. That actually would create this puzzle. Well, well, how did it ever get started? Why didn't we stay just as hunter-gatherers, right? Without any technological advance ever, if it really is just the scale that's going to be uh, a crucial element uh, in this process. This, uh, actually, having an appreciation for the, the relative sizes of populations is actually interesting because it does lead to this uh, uh, consideration uh, that, uh, you know, when we look back in English literature, I probably mentioned this already, that, sh I mean, Shakespeare clearly is amongst the greatest of all writers of English he came from an incredibly tiny community of literate people at the time uh, he was writing, right? Because he came from a society of three to four million people where most women were not engaged in intellectual production and where only a third of the population was literate. Uh, and so, I mean, one of the puzzles about Shakespeare is how he could be such an incredibly sophisticated writer given that he came from a small, uh, unassuming town. He came from the kind of the Dixon of England. <laughs> uh, and, and yet, is writing these incredibly elaborate fiction referring to all kinds of classical themes, stuff like that. And that's why there's this enduring puzzle about, well, how is this possible, <laughs> right? And in some sense, if you want a kind of ranking of genius, it's when you see someone like that and the community that he came from, <laughs> 
that you have more appreciation for the incredible achievements of some of these people in the past. But as I say, it does raise this puzzle, which is if size really matters in terms of, of economic growth and the production of ideas, then the problem is how do we ever escape the, uh, the Paleolithic, right? Uh, why didn't we all end up like the Tasmanians, which is making an occasional advance and then making an equal regression in later generations and never getting out of this world? And it also raises, as I say, this other issue, which is that there's an accident of the geography of the world that we live in these giant continents. Suppose that the entire world was just a bunch of Pacific islands. Suppose water covered 95% of the planet and there are just a few islands left in between that. Could it have been that there's another world where we would still be living in the Stone Age <laughs> if the geography had just been different like that so that every group was by necessity somewhat small and isolated and had very little ability to communicate with any other group and so that forgetting <laughs> dominated learning <laughs> in this early world. And so there are some, some amazing puzzles again about this kind of history just in terms of the interaction of geography and population and, you know, is it crucial, for example, that there's X thousand square miles of habitable surface of the Earth, right? Suppose that number had been much, much smaller. Uh, or suppose it had been much bigger. Would we have had a completely different uh, history in terms of world history? Uh, so that was the first thing that I wanted to emphasize was the, the forgetting amongst very small communities. A second feature, though, that also shows up, which is actually very surprising, is that even in very big societies, there are periods where we seem to get also technological forgetting. And the classic example of this is actually China. Right? Uh, and one of the uh, interesting things is if we had written a history of the world that ended in 1400, China would have been the dominant society you would want to have written about. And the society which had the most advanced technology, the greatest population densities, uh, the dominating society of, of the world uh, before 1400. Um, and uh, people like Marco Polo, who it's not certain actually that he ever actually got to China. <laughs> there's a lot of debate because there's some dramatic things in China that he somehow never managed to notice. Um, but when he's traveling from Europe to China uh, in the 1290s, uh, he's traveling from a primitive society to a much more sophisticated uh, society. And yet, uh, somehow, China began to stagnate after 1400. And by the time even the Portuguese reached China in 1514, had clearly fallen behind Europe in terms of a lot of uh, technology. And so it raises this other puzzle, which is how can it be that societies are sometimes dynamic but in other cases, simply freeze in terms of their ability or else start losing abilities. And the thing that makes the um, Chinese, sorry, let me erase this. What makes it very puzzling about the Chinese is that if you go up till about 1433, it seems like world history is heading in the direction where the Chinese are going to take over large parts of the world and maybe even take over Europe. <laughs> Because uh, in the period uh, 1405 to 1433, uh, the Chinese emperor organized a whole series of enormous naval expeditions. Uh, and uh, in uh, one of these, the one in 1405, uh, his admiral Zheng He, who was actually also ironically a, a eunuch in the imperial court, uh, sailed to Africa with a fleet of 300 ships incorporating 28,000 soldiers and sailors. Um, they looked at Africa, apparently they brought back things like giraffes and said, well, kind of picturesque, but there's not a lot of interest in this real estate. <laughs> uh, they visited southern India, uh, Calicut, which was the center of pepper and spice production in the world at that time. It was important, uh, and they sent emissaries there. They visited there, and then for some reason, after 1433, they simply stopped sending out these expeditions. Uh, and uh, they then quite quickly lost the capacity to actually engage in uh, 
uh, large scale uh, overseas sailing and, and then having large scale shipping that could travel long distances. Uh, but as I say, if you'd looked at the world just around 1405, uh, what you'd see is that the Chinese seem to be expanding, uh, showing interest in other societies, uh, have enormous capacity. I mean, the ability to send 28,000 people to Africa is something that was far beyond the Europeans uh, at that stage. At the same time as this is happening in the Indian Ocean and in China, the Portuguese are engaging in a centuries-long <coughs> pattern of exploration down the coast of Africa. And so they have made very little progress by 1405, but they're trying to find a way again to the Spice Islands that will be not through the Middle East, because the, the Middle East is the, the choke point in the spice trade. They're taking most of the profit in the trade. It's a Muslim world. Uh, there's two routes through the Middle East, but that's what gets the profit. And so the Portuguese are engaged in this expedition where they want to find a way to the Spice Islands that they can control. Uh, and so what happens then is that about 100 years after uh, the Chinese arrive in Calicut, the Portuguese get there. Uh, they arrive, instead of in 300 ships, they arrive in four ships. <laughs> uh, we believe that they had 170 men. A large fraction of them died on this voyage. Uh, and they reached there in 1498. But by 1514, the Portuguese had also managed to sail all the way to China. And by then, they bring, brought technology such as mechanical clocks and firearms that the Chinese found marvelous and uh, unexpected. Uh, and so there is this incredible kind of technological crossing of the two parts of Eurasia around about this period. And, and so one of the mysterious things in history is why societies like China can get to what seems like the verge of an industrial revolution already by 1400, but somehow pull back from the edge, not achieve that leap. And then this also ran society in Europe, somehow with much less capabilities, somehow takes this leap ahead, right? And so that's, there's lots of puzzles associated with the history of technology in terms of trying to understand this complicated history of advances, retreats, reaching the brink in various societies, but then not making the breakthrough, right? And, and one of the things we're going to have difficult to understand is, well, why didn't the Romans have an industrial revolution? Why didn't the Greeks have an industrial revolution? Why didn't the Chinese have an industrial revolution? They look very similar to the societies which eventually do have an industrial revolution. So what is different about these societies that eventually uh, make that breakthrough? Now, in terms of understanding that breakthrough, one of the problems that we face uh, in looking at history is that like a lot of previous societies, we actually tend to have our own dogmatic views of the past. And the, this prevailing dogma amongst economists is that people somehow are the same, have the same potential everywhere. And if only you give them the right incentives, growth will occur. Growth is just a function of the incentives that people are given. Right? If you can just find that right mixture, growth will occur. And the reason growth didn't occur in the world in the scale that we've seen since 1800, consequently, must be because early societies were systematically suppressing the natural incentives of the marketplace. And that what we'll find is, in all societies before 1800, we'll find that incentives were somehow severely limited. And so the, the economists, I mean, their kind of popular conception is that in societies like pre-industrial Europe, it's ruled by a violent and very stupid upper class. That upper class has taken away all the incentives for trade and production from their serfs and their, the lower class in the society. Uh, the church is dogmatic and rigid. It opposes on bizarre grounds any new technique. It burns at the stake anyone who dares to question orthodoxy. It's a rule by superstition, by brute force, by kind of uh, 
rigid class dominated societies uh, and that we live in a world of incentives, of mobility, of opportunity, and that that was the crucial difference that we had to achieve. And that's the picture actually that Adam Smith had in 1776 when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, that you know, growth depended on achieving incentives within societies, on limiting government, which was regarded as bad, as tending to, to be part of this superstitious and uh, oppressive regime. Uh, and that consequently, uh, that's what we mean. That, and, and, and that says that the thing we have to understand then about the world before 1800 and about the absence of economic growth is why societies would end up looking like this, right? Why they didn't end up having economic freedoms, having markets, having incentives offered to people. Why the upper classes were so rigid and stupid <laughs> that they kept everyone in poverty within this world and how that transformation was achieved, right? And that is to say, that's the, the ruling ideology in economics amongst my fellow economic historians. It's the ruling ideology with probably 99% of all economic historians. I mean, that's their commitment, is to understanding why the institutions of these early societies were just so poor and how we achieved eventually and only after thousands of years this particular type of uh, regime. Now, one puzzle with this is, in some sense, the institutions of any society are arbitrary and relatively costless, right? They're just the rules that dictate who produces things and how stuff is getting distributed, right? And we can change those institutions relatively easily, right? Obama can come in and write a new law that says, now healthcare will be done this way as opposed to that way, right? Or now, you know, AIG, uh, now you're entitled to 400 billion instead of 1 billion, right? Uh, and so that the institutions of the society, in some sense, they're, they're, they're very cheap to change in some ways. And so the, the, the amazing puzzle with this view is, well, even if societies were to randomly choose institutions, why wouldn't one of them in all of this history have actually chosen the institutions of relatively free markets and social mobility and consequently achieved dramatic economic growth thousands of years before we eventually had an industrial revolution? For this view to make sense, there must be something about early societies that systematically makes them <laughs> choose these very bad institutions. There must be something about the structure of these societies that always pushes them in the direction of these bad institutions. But we'll come back and, and talk about that when we talk about the Industrial Revolution. But the important thing that I want to convey uh, now is that that picture about the past is about as superstitious and dogmatic <laughs> as the views of the medieval church uh, on a number of uh, theological issues. It's actually not supported by evidence from the past. It turns out that we can find plenty of pre-industrial societies which had better economic incentives than the societies that we live in. That medieval people were actually fully incentivized in terms of production, mobility, everything else. And that our kind of assumption that somehow we live in a world of opportunity and mobility and access and openness and that others didn't is, is really just an assumption that we derive from our high incomes and is not based on any kind of systematic analysis of these early societies. And so uh, how can we show that? Well, let, let's just take one example that we actually have lots of information about uh, but this is likely not the only society which had uh, these possibilities. And that is to say, uh, let's look at uh, medieval England. What are one of the things that economists emphasize in the modern world in terms of getting good incentives in the society? The first feature that economists have emphasized is that society should have low taxes. Right? That you don't want to have very high tax rates because that will discourage people from production and from enterprise. Uh, people tend to kind of assume, well, it must be in this medieval world that lords are taxing the peasants heavily, they're stealing all their output, there's this huge collection by the government. It turns out that that's completely false. If we actually take England and then look at it in 1300 
than in the year 2000? What is the average tax rate in England in the year 1300? If you're actually looking at the central government and the church, it's between about 1 and 5 percent. What's the average tax rate in England in 2000 on income? It's about, at the margin, it's 41 percent. Right? The English government, or the UK government now, seizes two-fifths of everything that people produce in this society. The government in the medieval period could never contemplate doing that. The one time it tried to impose a new tax in 1377, it led to the Peasants' Revolt and to the seizure of London and the murder of a number of high government officials. <laughs> and that was when it tried to impose a tax that was less than one day's wages <laughs> on people in the society. Right? Uh, this society is actually something like medieval England. Government is very tightly constrained <laughs> uh, by the parliament and by a complete unwillingness to pay taxes. The 1% is what the central government get. It was counted as 5% if you also count the taxes that the church is able to collect through the tithe. Right? But the interesting thing about those taxes that the church collect is that mostly those fell on land. And the one thing we know from modern economic doctrine is that the one type of taxation that is not discouraging incentives is largely taxation on land. And the reason for that is that land is there. It can't run away. It's, as long as it's appropriately not too heavy, you can tax a lot of the benefits of land away without changing any of the use of that land. Whereas the argument is that with labor, the more you tax it, the more you, you, you encourage people to take leisure as opposed to engaging in uh, production. Okay? And, and labor is much more mobile. Okay? And so the interesting thing is that these tax rates are, in fact, incredibly low. Uh, in terms of the peasant and the lord in medieval England in this period, theoretically, the peasants were the serfs of the lords. But in the course of the 13th century, they had managed to prevent the lords from ever raising the rents on their holdings. Rents were fixed by customary means. There was a gradual inflation in the society, and also population density was going up. Land was becoming much more valuable. It ended up, instead of the lords owning the peasants, it was the peasants who owned the lords. They were in these fantastic rent-controlled <laughs> agricultural holdings that the lords would have been more than happy <laughs> to have the peasants run away from because then they could have rented it at higher rents than the, their theoretical serfs were actually paying to them. That's why serfdom in England came to be absolutely meaningless. It's because the serfs expropriated the lords, not the other way around. And serfdom became actually a valuable opportunity, that people could sell the opportunity to be a serf to other people. <laughs> and people wanted that opportunity because it was like having a rent-controlled apartment in Manhattan or in San Francisco. Uh, it was the landlord that was being expropriated there, not the, the tenant. And so the interesting thing, as I say, is that England is actually an incredibly low-tax society. That continues all the way through the pre-industrial period. England now, by the way, is a high-tax society, but it is not the highest-tax society in terms of rich societies in the modern world. This represents the marginal tax rate on income. So it's for the average taxpayer, for the last dollar I earn, how much does the government take in terms of all collections? Uh, Belgium, in 2000, the government take is actually 66 cents per dollar. The government seizes two-thirds of all the output that people produce at the margin in a society like that. Right? And so that's the first thing that's kind of startling is these are societies with growth, with high labor inputs, with high incomes. This is a society of stagnation, <laughs> of relatively low labor inputs and very low output. These are the incentivized people. These are the people who should be staying home and growing their garden. <laughs> Why doesn't it work that way? Why is it these people are working and these people apparently are doing very little? Okay. We'll come back and talk about that on Monday, of course, once you've had your uh, long weekend.